Um, firstly, thank you, sir, for that introduction. Just checking quickly, can everyone hear me at the back? Everything okay? Fabulous. Um, okay, so I guess my story starts uh, when I was 14 years old. My family decided to go vegetarian, and out of my family, I was the most reluctant to make this change. I enjoyed the taste of meat and dairy, but I was open-minded enough to try out vegetarianism. Skip forward to today, I'm now 18 years old, my family and I are now vegan, and veganism has completely changed my life. Since making this decision, my perspective on so many things has altered. And as I've began to learn more about the benefits of a plant-based food system, I've realized that it's going to be a big part of the resolution to some of the world's biggest issues. Um, today, I'd like to share some of the things I've learned about this topic, and I've broken this presentation down into three rough sections. And first, I'd like to consider the environment. According to the United Nations, the livestock sector represents 14.5% of all human-made greenhouse gas emissions globally. This makes the industry the second largest greenhouse gas emitting sector, after heating and electricity, but greater than the whole of the transportation sector combined. This means that animal agriculture contributes more greenhouse gas emissions than all of the world's cars, trains, planes, and buses combined. So why is rearing animals so environmentally unfriendly? Well, as many of you will already know, methane is produced from the digestive systems of ruminant animals, including cows and sheep, as well as from the decomposition of their manure. In fact, this industry represents nearly half of all the global methane emissions that we produce, a greenhouse gas which is 34 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, secondly, due to land use changing from forests and soils to agricultural areas needed to graze animals and grow their food, we lose roughly 0.65 gigatons of carbon dioxide capture per year. Within the UK, around 85% of agricultural land is used directly for grazing and feeding animals so we can eat them. But despite animal products needing the majority of the agricultural land, they only contribute to 48% of protein and 32% of calories consumed by the UK. This is due to the low efficiency with which animals convert cereals to meat and milk. In fact, for every 100 calories we feed to animals in the form of human edible crops, we receive just 17 to 30 calories in the form of animal-based proteins. Receiving our caloric intake by eating animal products will always be inherently inefficient. Research suggests that if everybody shifted to a plant-based diet, we would re reduce global land use for agriculture by a staggering 75%. These areas could then be rewilded, which is a process where land is, um, where land is restored back to its uncultivated state. This improves biodiversity, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and we could even reintroduce species that were previously hunted out of the wild. The livestock sector also contributes to water pollution. Waste from farms is usually stored in large pits called lagoons and eventually sprayed in mass amounts onto fields. However, during heavy rainfall, animal sewage from fields and lagoons runs off into water systems. This can cause a process called eutrophication because the sewage is high in nutrients such as ammonia and excess nitrates, and this can let then lead to dead zones, an example of which you can see behind me here. According to the WWF, cattle ranching is responsible for 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Although it's often reported that the main culprits are soy and palm oil production, this is in fact false, since beef production ravages more than double the amount of land compared to soy, palm oil, and wood products combined. In fact, on the topic of soy globally, around 77% of soy production is fed directly to livestock. In 30 years from now, we are going to have to feed 9.7 billion people. However, world hunger is already impacting 10% of the global population. How are we going to feed such a huge population if we can't even cope at the moment? Well, a study published in 2018 stated that technically, we already produce far enough crops to feed, to, to feed the current global population. If we reclaimed the 34% of global crops just consumed by animals, as well as cutting down on food waste and crops grown for biofuel, we could theoretically provide 5,935 calories per person per day. 
So by decreasing our animal product consumption, not only can we limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well as other forms of environmental harm, we may also be on the way to feeding the growing population that we expect to see in the next century. The National Food Strategy performed an independent review of the UK food system in July 2021. The review stated, we simply cannot reduce methane emissions to a safe level, nor free up the land we need for sequestering carbon, without reducing the amount of meat we eat. Despite the fact that this report was commissioned by the UK government itself, and then the findings were backed up by the chief scientific advisor, Rishi Sunak completely disregarded the review on live TV. He then stated in the Telegraph um, that he was going to put a renewed focus on animal agriculture and boost production instead. Why? Well, as he said in his own words, he has hundreds of beef and lamb farmers in his constituency. So to summarise what happened, the government paid an independent organisation to carry out a food systems review. It was completed and told us that we must reduce our animal product consumption. Then the now leader of our country blatantly turned round and said that not only was he going to ignore these suggestions, but that he was going to put a renewed focus and boost production instead. I think this tells us everything we need to know about our current Prime Minister's commitment to the environment. In 2018, a study by the University of Oxford was, was published that reviewed nearly 40,000 farms across the globe. The study is considered to be the most comprehensive database on emissions around it, uh, surrounding food. One of the study's main findings was the fact that avoiding the consumption of animal products delivers far better environmental benefits than trying to purchase even sustainable forms of meat and dairy. After the study was published, the lead researcher also stated in an article, a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water use. Here is um, an infographic from the study, and as you can see, animal-based products tend to have significantly higher carbon footprints than their plant-based alternatives. A reduction in the consumption of animal products is going to be essential if the UK, and indeed the rest of the world, are serious about meeting our climate targets and limiting global warming. It is not simply going to be enough to start driving electric cars and flying less, since our food choices have such monumental impacts on so many different aspects of our environment. As well as the health of our environment, we also have to consider our own health too. According to the American Cancer Society, processed red meat, including ham, bacon, pepperoni and sausage, is listed as a group one carcinogen along with plutonium and tobacco smoke. As well as that, red meat, such as steak and lamb, is listed in group 2A, titled Probably Carcinogenic to Human Health. There is a plethora of strong evidence linking red and processed meat consumption with certain diseases, including colorectal cancer, which is the fourth most common cancer in the UK, as well as heart disease, which is the world's leading killer. Researchers at the University of Oxford's Department of Population Health conducted a large systematic review of the links between heart disease and different types of red and processed meat. They found that for each 50 gram per day intake, intake of processed meat, this increased the risk of coronary heart disease by 18%. Another study fed healthy volunteers on strict types of diets, ranging from completely vegetarian to very high in animal products. After analysing cells from the volunteer's colon, those on the diet containing the highest, highest amount of meat showed the largest number of cells with DNA damage. Heart disease and cancers are the world's number one and number two killers, respectively. So if the evidence linking these diseases to our Western diet high in animal, pro animal products is so strong, why are we not seeing a huge surge from the government to promote switching to a plant-based diet? Well, the answer to that is complex, but starts with meat lobbyists and farmers' unions having a monumental influence on governmental policies and even scientific research. Since we were young, TV adverts and the media have been selling us the idea that milk and dairy products are healthy and essential for our teeth and bones. But really, how much of this is true? Firstly, let's strip dairy back to exactly what it is. Fundamentally, it is a growth medium. It is used to transform a small calf into a big, fully grown cow. 
And as you would expect, this type of growth requires a nutritionally dense and energy dense food source. The components of milk are perfect for bulking up baby cows, but not for humans. And this is part of the reason why 60% of the global population is lactose intolerant. Humans are the only mammalian species that continue to consume milk after infancy, and this is highly unusual. Dairy cows produce milk to feed their children, and every time we take it and put it in our cereal or our coffee, there was a calf that should have received that food. But milk builds strong bones, right? Well, a large-scale a large study from, the university of, from Harvard University followed 72,000 women for two decades and found no evidence that drinking milk can prevent bone fractures or osteoporosis. Contrary to what we've been told, funnily enough, some studies have even, have even found that the complete opposite happens. It has been suggested that diets high in calcium from dairy products put, puts an individual at greater risk for stress fractures. Dairy has been associated with an increased risk of certain types of breast cancer. It is linked to acne, prostate cancer, and is also one of the leading contributors to saturated fat levels within the American diet. It is completely possible to obtain all the calcium that our body requires from different sources. Kale, for example, has a higher calcium content than cow's milk per 100 grams and also has a higher absorption rate within the body. The dairy industry is undoubtedly powerful and often uses its massive government subsidies to fund research. Funnily enough, this research usually produces pro-dairy findings. For example, in 2017, the Royal Osteoporosis Society carried out a survey and then reported that diets which cut out dairy could be a ticking time bomb for young people's health. The information was then further shared on news sites such as the BBC. Unfortunately, what was failed to be mentioned is that the Royal Osteoporosis Society is funded by Yoplait, which is the world's largest franchise brand of yogurt. Yoplait donates annually to the society in both um, Ireland and the UK. This is not an isolated event, because something similar occurred when the University of Reading published a meta-analysis on the risks of cardiovascular disease associated with dairy. Um, as you may have already guessed, the study, found that, um, the study found that dairy does not increase the risk of heart attack or stroke. However, reading the fine print of the study will show you that it was funded by the Global Dairy Platform, the Dairy Research Institute, and Dairy Australia. A pattern is beginning to emerge. Powerful dairy companies fund research. The findings churn out, churn out results that seem to show dairy consumption is beneficial for human health. The headlines are then shared, however, often with no mention of these huge conflicts of interest. Dairy propaganda is rife, but one fact will always remain true. Humans have no nutritional need to consume the breast milk of another mammal. It is very possi possible to be completely healthy on a vegan or plant-based diet at every stage of life. Diets consisting of whole plant-based sources have been linked to so many positive health outcomes, including lowering risk from type 2 diabetes, heart disease, as well as can heart disease and cancer, as well as aiding with weight loss. As well as that, diets rich in plant foods provide high amounts of fiber, helping with digestion and preventing constipation. However, of course, it's worth noting that not all vegan diets are created equal. If you're only eating Oreos and Pringles all day, that's not going to be as healthy as sticking to whole, unprocessed plant foods. The only nutrient not found naturally within a vegan diet is vitamin B12, um, but this can be easily supplemented by eating vitamin B12 fortified foods or from taking supplements. It's also worth noting that 90% of global vitamin B12 is fed directly to livestock, so chances are you're already supplementing it in one way or another. As well as the effects of directly consuming animal products, there are also secondary interactions between the animal industries and our health. Worldwide, it is estimated that 66% of all antibiotics are used in farm animals, not people. Because we house, house such a huge number of animals in poor farming systems, bacterial diseases are likely to spread. But this means giving antibiotics to animals routinely. In other words, before they've even got sick. In the UK, it's still very legal to do this, as well as give antibiotics to farm animals to compensate for inadequate hygiene, as well as 
um, importing animal foods with antibiotic growth promoters. All of these practices have, however, been outlawed in the European Union. It is expected that, ge that generating antibiotic-resistant bacteria from farm animals will pose a risk to humans and contribute to the 10 million yearly deaths we expect to see from antibiotic resistance by 2050. Due to the sheer scale of animal farming across the globe, there's also another health impact that we're all too familiar with. The farming systems that we have in place are the absolute perfect recipe for breeding the next global pandemic. 2009 swine flu was traced back to a pig farm in North, in North Carolina. 1918 influenza is believed to have started on a chicken farm in Kansas. Mad cow disease originated in UK cattle. Nipah virus was traced back to a pig farm in Malaysia. And the list goes on and on. And of course, the coronavirus pandemic has strong evidence linking its origins to wet markets in China. These markets sell meat and fish and often include caged animals who are killed on the spot. Overcrowded conditions can let viruses from different animals swap genes and begin to infect people. And with 90% of farmed animals living on factory farms, it is no surprise that experts in infectious diseases have warned that COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic, with some even referring to it as a dress rehearsal for what's about to come. The average amount of meat we eat, meat consumed per person globally has nearly doubled in the past 50 years. It is estimated that each year we kill 80 billion land animals and one to 2.8 trillion marine animals for food. These numbers are so large, they're incomprehensible. The large majority of the land animals we kill for food each year in the UK are chickens. Over 90% of broiler chickens, which are birds specifically raised for their meat, live permanently in dark, overcrowded barns amid their own waste. The barns are generally bare, except for feeding and drinking lines with wood shavings on the floor to absorb the chicken's excrement. Typically, around 25,000 birds can be housed together. However, the largest barns can, ac can accommodate double this amount. The 2007 EU directive on broiler chickens permitted the equivalent of around 19 birds per square meter of floor space. This equates to less than the size of an A4 sheet of paper per chicken. Broilers have been continuously bred to grow bigger and more quickly. In fact, broiler chickens today are four times bigger than they were in the 1950s. In intensive farming systems, chickens will commonly be slaughtered when, before they reach 42 days old, despite the fact that these animals can live to up to six years under natural conditions. Unfortunately, there are huge welfare costs to having a, such a rapid growth rate. Broiler chickens spend most of their time lying down because their bodies um, aren't strong, because their legs aren't strong enough to support their heavy body weight. The strain on their hearts and lungs mean that many chickens die each year from heart disease and sudden death syndrome. As well as that, the ammonia released from the chicken's droppings pollutes the air in the barns, which can cause respiratory problems, as well as causing painful burns on their, leg, their legs, chest, and feet. There is a common misconception within the UK that we don't house chickens in battery cages anymore. However, this is far from the truth. According to data from the RSPCA, of the 38 million commercial egg-laying hens in 2017, Nearly half of eggs were kept in hens, kept for, um, were from hens kept in battery cages. Barren battery cages were banned throughout Europe in January 2012, and new enriched battery cages took their place. These so-called enriched cages, again, legally permit less than the size of a sheet of A4 paper per bird. Needless to say, the hens kept in these wire cages cannot perform any of their natural activities, such as perching, foraging, and nesting and often show signs of psychological distress, including pecking each other's feathers out, which can further lead to cannibalism and leaving gaping wounds open to infection. Hens in the wild lay just 20 eggs per year, but thanks to high protein feed and near constant lighting, hens can be pushed to lay closer to 500 eggs annually. This exhausts them, and then once a bird's egg laying ability declines at around 12 months old, they're sent to a slaughterhouse to be made into cheap meat. However, the hidden cost of the egg industry comes in the form of the 29 million male baby chicks born each year in the UK. 
The egg business has no use for male chicks, since they cannot produce eggs and their bodies are not suitable for meat production either. So instead, they're sent to be killed. And this happens among all farms, including on free range and organic systems. They are macerated or they're gassed with argon or ammonia. And this usually all happens on the first day of their life. After that, it's likely that their remains will be ground up to make pet food. But what about free range and organic farming systems for chickens? Surely these must mean higher welfare. Well, first, let's talk numbers. In the chicken meat industry, it's estimated that only 4.4% of birds are raised in free range or organic systems. But even then, um, in, the free, in the egg industry, free range rises to around 49%. But even then, we need to clarify what these terms, free range and organic, mean. TV adverts and other forms of media are very effective at painting a picture of happy chickens pecking in green grassland. But considering the UK's yearly demand for 13 billion eggs and 900 million slaughtered chickens, it's hard to believe that any significant percentage of these animals live in such fantasy conditions. There is legislation in place which defines what free range and organic chickens are entitled to, which you can see behind me. Now, I'm only speaking in terms of chicken here because the term free range has no legal definition for pork, lamb or beef. Legally, free range chickens in the UK must have continuous daytime access to outdoor vegetation for at least half their life. However, at night and in adverse weather conditions, these chickens are put back into barns, once again living amid thousands of other birds. There is also no regulation about how often chickens must go outside, and therefore the, some birds will just be far too enclosed within the multi-tier barns to find one of the few exit holes available. So in reality, they spend much of their life similar to the chickens in the barn systems. In early 2020, about 150 activists from the organisation Direct Action Everywhere exposed a free-range farm in East Sussex. They found distressed hens living amongst visibly decomposing dead birds, which were left lying in the barns. As well as being free-range, this farm was certified as RSPCA assured and had the British Lion Quality stamp. Many of the hens at the back of these large multi-tier sheds would never have had access to the outside area. Free-range chickens and RSPCA assured chickens still undergo a painful mutilation called beak trimming. This routine practice includes using an infrared beam to amputate up to one third of a chick's beak. The practice is supposed to stop chickens causing birds, uh, causing injury to others by viciously pecking at their feathers. Instead of granting these animals what they really deserve, which is just, a, just more space and, and space to practice their natural behaviors, we instead decide to mutilate parts of their body without the use of any form of anesthetic. Research has suggested that beak trimming can, can lead to both acute and chronic pain for the chicken. However, regardless of these labels, no matter what, the, what type of farming system a chicken originates from, once their exhausted bodies no longer satisfy the economic goals of their farmer, they are all taken to the same slaughterhouse and reach the same end. According to the RSPCA, there are two main slaughter techniques for chickens. The first is electrical stunning, where birds are shackled live upside down on a conveyor belt. They often have their legs and wings broken in the process. They move along a production line to, into an electric water bath. A current will stun the bird, and then a mechanical neck cutter will sever the major blood vessels in their neck. The second method of chicken slaughter in the UK is gas killing, where a mixture of inert gases such as argon or ammonia will kill the birds once they're, whilst they're still in their transport crates. Pigs are believed to be the fourth most intelligent animal. They are consistently shown by animal experts to be more trainable than both dogs and cats. Some studies have even shown that pigs will outperform three-year-old human children on cognitive tests. Contrary to what we're often told, pigs are naturally slender animals and only get fat from overfeeding. They also are naturally hygienic and only roll in mud to cool themselves down, much like, ha like how elephants do. A study by the Wellbeing Institute stated that pigs exhibit emotional contagion, 
which is the ability to feel the emotional state of another. And this is thought to be the basis for empathy. These beautiful animals can bond to others, including with humans, as well as experience feelings such as joy, loneliness, fear, but above all else, suffering. So considering all of this, why do we, why do we view animals such as dogs and cats as our loving companions, and yet subject pigs, who are more intelligent and equally able to form bonds with us, to such horrific abuses? Over 10 million pigs were slaughtered in the UK in 2017 and only a tiny 3% of British pigs will spend their entire lives outdoors. The rest of the pigs live in indoor sheds in order to, to be fattened up to their target weight of 100 kilograms. The pigs live on partially slatted floors. This is supposedly there to enable excrement to wash out, but crowding as usual, they don't legally have to be pro uh, provided with any straw or mud, so what ends up happening is they wallow in their own waste. As you can imagine, in such an environment, diseases will run rife. Next, I'd like to talk about breeding sows. These are female breeding pigs. To ensure the sow becomes pregnant, a farmer will artificially inseminate her with boar semen. Then, a week before the sow is ready to give birth, she will be moved to a farrowing crate in an indoor system. Farrowing crates are large metal cages designed to be only centimeter, centimeters larger than the sow's body. The sow will remain in this cage for up to four weeks after the birth, giving birth to her piglets. As you can see, the pig is unable to turn around and she, cannot, she is deprived of her natural birthing behaviors, since in the wild, sows are naturally active and will give, um, build a nest in the week before giving birth. The industry st states that farrowing crates are there to protect piglet welfare and staff person safety. However, statistics show that piglet mortality is roughly the same in outdoor systems where farrowing crates are not used. And for context, around 60% of UK farms still use farrowing crates. Just three to six days after her last litter has been weaned, it is time for the pig to get pregnant again and the cycle continues. For context, if you see a pork product being assured as red tractor, this actually means very little in terms of real animal welfare. Red tractor farms still permit farrowing crages, the pigs living on bare concrete floors, as well as the routine mutilation of docking piglets' tails. Tail docking is a procedure carried out to stop agitated pigs from biting each other's tails, much like beak trimming in the chicken industry. Thanks to some really clever marketing techniques and a nice stamp in your shopping basket, Red Tractor Farms continue to sell the fantasy idea of high welfare, often to consumers who are looking to justify what they're buying. In the UK, 86% of pigs are slaughtered in gas chambers, where carbon dioxide is used to suffocate them. The gas acidifies the moisture around their brains, their eyes, and in their throats, and it has been compared to the feeling of burning from the inside out. Eventually, they will suffocate to death. In the UK, it is still legal to kill infant lambs, piglets, and kids by delivering a heavy blow to the head or through blunt force trauma. This is often performed by holding the animal by its back legs, swinging them in an arc to hit the head with considerable force amongst a solid ob object, against a solid object. This practice is deemed to be humane by the Humane Slaughter Association. Gas chambers, routine mutilation, blunt force trauma. Not only are these practices all legal within this industry, but farmers' organizations will go as far to say that they are humane. The word humane, objectively, means to have or to show compassion or benevolence. In other words, showing kindness. How can these acts be associated with a word that means kindness, when if we did these things to the animals in our homes, we would be committing a criminal offense? These animals have a preference to live, just like our pets, and taking their life from them when we don't have to can never be an act of compassion. Humane slaughter is an oxymoron. There is no compassionate way to end the life of an animal who doesn't want to die and doesn't need to die. In June 2021, the animal welfare group Surge visited Willoughby Wold Piggeries in Scarborough. This farm was Red Tractor certified and a known supplier of pork products to Morrison's, Asda, Sainsbury's and Tesco. What the group found in the barns was described as hell on earth. 
they uncovered row upon row of dead, dying and long dead pigs which lay amongst the living. Swollen, fetid carcasses were found all around the farm, with the bodies starting to turn black from decomposition. The psychological trauma of um, being trapped inside the pens meant some of the younger pigs were starting to cannibalise on, uh, on the dead ones. Dr Alice Bruff, who audited pigs for pig farms for Red Tractor, said in a statement, This is among some of the most harrowing footage I've seen captured in the UK. Unfortunately, the serious health and welfare issues on this farm are not unique, and they reflect much wider concerns across the industry. According to this professional, the animal abuses occurring at Willoughby Wold are not the exception to the rule, and it's likely that your pork products may have come from a farm with similarities to this. On all dairy farms, regardless of which labels are eventually stuck onto the milk cartons, there are certain practices which remain the same across the board. In order for the mother cow to become pregnant, starting from around 15 months of age, the cow is led into a confined space where a farmer inserts, inserts one arm into the cow's anus to re, re, um, manipulate her reproductive organs. Then an artificial insemination gun is inserted into her vagina to deposit sperm. This process is invasive, painful, and traumatic for the cow. The cow will soon become pregnant and carry her baby for around nine months. After the birth, despite forming a deep and loving connection to their young, the mother cow is often only given a few hours with her newborn calf until they are sep forcibly separated. This is the harsh reality on all types of dairy farms because quite simply, the more milk the calf drinks, the less the farmer can sell. After the removal, the mother cows can begin to show signs of attraction issues and have, have been known to bellow for days trying to locate their missing calf. Meanwhile, the newborns are placed in solitary confinement pens where they can spend up to eight weeks completely alone without the care of their mother. They are fed formula instead of receiving nature's perfect mix of anti antibodies and nutrients which they would get in their mother's milk. Of course, only the female cows get the luxury of staying, the luck of staying alive, and they are subject, subjected to the same fate as their mothers. Unfortunately, if the calf is born a male, he has nothing that the farmer can exploit, since he won't produce milk and also doesn't have the correct body plan to be used for meat either. So, either the calf will be exported to be used as veal, or more likely shot in the head after birth. These beautiful mother cows, who just like us are capable of building deep connections to their children, are robbed of their babies. They're then robbed of their baby's food and expected to become milking machines. A dairy cow is supposed to push herself through this process four times in her life. And when her body is finally exhausted and she can't do it anymore, she'll be sent to a slaughterhouse to be made into cheap meat. Why do we push these, put these animals through such exploitation or for a product that humans aren't even supposed to consume. Everybody in this room is already taking responsibility for the products that they buy and what they choose to eat. However, we are all influenced heavily by marketing camp campaigns, meat lobbyists, and our cultural norms. For example, in our minds, we associate celebrations such as Easter with rebirth and new beginnings, and yet we celebrate this rebirth by eating a dead baby lamb. We have successfully uncoupled the animal life from the product. We see veal, beef, and pork instead of calf, cow, and pig. When in reality, these animals are sentient. They are capable of thinking, suffering, creating bonds with each other, just like our beloved pets in our homes. When you have two incompatible views, but only act upon one of them, namely saying you love animals, but at the same time eating them, Perhaps it's time to try and consider aligning your morals with your actions. Maybe the next time that you're shopping for your lunch, ask yourself, how has this animal probably lived? What's worth more, the 15 minutes of sensory pleasure that I may get from eating their flesh, or this sentient being's whole entire existence? Be knowledgeable of phrases such as from trusted farms, red tractor, or even free range. If you believe that we need to protect our environment and prevent the next global pandemic, or you're health-oriented and want to, to reduce your chances of cancer or heart disease, try phasing out animal products. You don't have to say to yourself, 
okay, starting from now, I'm going to be vegan for the rest of my life because that is l very unrealistic and almost certainly won't last. But I have found that taking things one day at a time, one meal at a time, is the best way to go about it. Your health, the planet, and of course the animals will reap the benefits of a plant-based food system. Thank you for listening. The, the thing around their, uh, their beaks? Yeah. I'm not sure. Perhaps it, it might just be a, a side effect from having such a, a massive growth rate in such a short period of time. But all I can say is that th th because their bodies are now so strong, if you think about it, their legs are largely the same, but it's their massive body weight that's getting bigger and bigger. And just like if we were to do that to humans, I think, the, I think you can imagine what the results might, might be. Yeah, any other questions? Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely got capitalistic uh, undertones and ventures, absolutely. I mean, the way we used to farm was, well, it started with just backyard farms, small-scale farms, and then what happened was people began to say, well, actually, if I, if I get more animals and can put them in a smaller space, I can make more money, and then I can sell them to my friends over here, and that's, that's exactly how agriculture, be animal agriculture began to build, and that's how we've ended up with the factory farming that we see today. But... I think, I think what's important is even, even in, in non-factory farms, I mean, again, the majority of our meat, dairy, and eggs do come from there anyway, but even in those non-factory farms, these animals are still all taken to a slaughterhouse to get onto our plate, and that, that is a, a horrific process that we wouldn't put our animals at home through ever. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. That's a really great question, and there have been some really good studies on the mental health of slaughterhouse workers and farm workers, and it's not, it's not a good story. Um, I think there was something in the news the other week about a farm, uh, did anyone hear about a farm in Bristol? I think there was a problem, there was some crime being committed by one of the, the workers in the slaughterhouse, but yeah, there's some really good evidence about the mental health issue, the mental health of slaughterhouse workers and, and animal farm workers in particular. So the effect on human health is drastic as well as the effect on the animals directly. And also, you know, when I was talking about pandemics and antibiotic resistance, these are, these are secondary effects. These are secondary effects of the industry, not the primary effects of eating them, but it, almost this topic encap encapsulates so many issues around um, human health as well as just the, the health of the, the animals directly. Yeah, really good question. Anything else? Yeah, so that's, it's quite a common misconception about veganism that almost if we, if everyone went vegan tonight, we'd have these thousands of millions of animals roaming around. And that wouldn't happen because practically, practically the shift to, to veganism is going to be gradual. It's not going to be one of overnight where everybody just goes. So, and the reason that we have so many animals here in the first place is because farmers breed them into existence. These are all animals that have been made through artificial insemination, hatcheries, all of these sort of things, breeding programs. So it's not like these animals would overpopulate because the shift to veganism would be gradual. So as more and more people stopped consuming these products, less animals would be bred into existence. So the problem of overpopulation hopefully wouldn't be an issue. Um, yeah. Yeah, you at the back. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if, we, if we all went plant-based, what would happen is, is we, at the moment we don't grow enough crops to to, because we grow so many crops to feed animals, we'd have to repurpose some of that land to obviously feed the, gro the, the population without the animal products. Um, but we have to eat. We have to eat something. So those, those, there would still be jobs for these people. But also, I think what we need to think about is our governments. Government, governments at the moment give massive subsidies to meat, dairy, meat and dairy farms in particular. I mean, we're talking millions and millions of pounds each year. If those subsidies were still given to those farmers, because those farmers 
farmers and agricultural workers deserve those subsidies, don't get me wrong, but the industry needs to be framed in a way that it's not producing these harmful, harmful products that maybe, as I was talking about earlier, we, instead of giving the subsidies to the farmers to produce meat and dairy, we give the subsidies to the farmers in order that they return the land to an uncultivated state and do something called rewilding. So, um, yeah, hopefully we wouldn't ever get to a point where um, I guess there would be mass scale loss of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so a couple of things about that. Um, firstly, the avocados are, of course, an issue, but remember, we, there is a, in the UK, we grow more agricultural land to feed animals than we do to feed us directly from human consumption. So that the problem of killing animals in, like the bees, you say, will also be a problem with growing the food to feed the animals. Avocados are an issue, but again, they're not specific to veganism. Uh, everybody, you know, Avocados aren't just something that's eaten by vegans, um, so that's a problem as well. And, and obviously that needs to be addressed and has its own, own issues, and we wouldn't want any bees to be mass cold. Um, but yeah, also I think, I think avocados can often be used as perhaps uh, quite a common talking point against veganism. But actually when I was doing some research a couple of weeks ago about... Um, about so the, the, the difference between 100 grams of locally sourced hamburger, so a locally sourced animal product, versus 100 grams of avocado shipped from halfway across the world. And what, we, what the leading scientific consensus shows is that even those locally produced animal products are still significantly worse for the environment than when you ship, it, ship avocados in from halfway across the world. Because, and this is the reason, generally transport emissions from food are much, much less than the emissions of, of that, that food. So, in, in a kind of sentence to sum it up, what you eat is far more important than when you, where your food comes from in terms of the food miles sort of thing about the avocados, if that makes sense. Well, um, a couple of things. We, at the moment, I'm, we trawl the ocean floors to get thousands of fish, which has its own problems for the biodiversity of the oceans. Um, we have such a huge population that if everyone to, were to have fish, that would be a disastrous effect for the, the health of our oceans. But also, I guess, if you consider it from the individual perspective of that animal, if you were, and um, we know fish are sentient, we know fish can feel pain, that's been scientifically proven. Um, if you were a fish in the sea, would do you want to be consumed and pulled out of the ocean? Um, by, for, would, would that be something that you'd want as a fish? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but should we base our morality on that of wild animals? Okay. Next question. Yeah. Um, well, I think from a practical perspective, we're very, very far off ever getting there. Um, but I would think, why, why would we need to? Why would we need to do that when we could? choose something like veganism, which is so accessible to everybody in this room right now, why would we almost go through the whole process of trying to genetically engineer animals to not feel, not feel empathy? I think that would be probably a more complex route to go about it. And, I, and also, I think with that sort of method, you'd, the level of suffering that you might have to get to that point, you know, in, in terms of testing on those animals, trying to find out which nerves to sever or something like that, I, th I think that wouldn't uh, perhaps be the right option. When, when you have something like veganism, which is pretty accessible to most of the people in this room, not granted not everybody in the world, but us here in St Albans, what we can, when we can make that decision. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Because if you are turning a blind eye to the consequences of what you're doing, 
doing if you've never thought of it? He said, you really should. You need to balance out, as Olivia has said, <coughs> your pleasure and the impact that it is having. I don't think you can have a firm view on any topic unless you have seen, understood, and heard the consequences. Then you can make a decision. Thank you very much.